I'm happy to introduce Dr. Christine Kudakachi from the University of Nebraska Omaha to give her presentation. Um, that'll be about 20 minutes and then we have um, 10 minutes at the end for question and answer. So if you want to, um, participants want to go ahead and um, include any questions you have in the chat um, and we can go through those at the end. Welcome. Thanks, Dr. Aiken. Appreciate the kind introduction. Welcome, everyone, albeit virtually. It's great to see you just in mini version, essentially. Um, today, I'll tell a short story, and we're talking about data. So I know we're surrounded by folks who love data. It's a warm, welcoming uh, group here. Today, we're talking about data-driven decision-making for SciComm of all ages. And the theme is, how do we know if we're speaking clearly and if they're hearing us? Right? Um, I hear often folks saying, well, I told them this. I, I told my students this information. I'm like, well, did they understand it? Were they able to process it? Are they able to tell you more about it? And if the answer to the latter of that is no, then you didn't say it. And so that's going to be our main theme in thinking about STEM education today. So this idea is first we start with inquiry, of course, you know, things that make us curious, th things that make us want to learn more about it and then go through the process of communication. And after that's taken place, that's when we can really move the learner to a higher level of learning um, to include things like scaffolding and really enhancing their understanding of the information. And so that's the theme that we take into practice routinely. I'll tell you a bit about a couple of our programs today. One is the Nebraska STEM for You program that many of you are participants in or have seen across the state. And this is a pipeline program for K through eight students, but similarly designed as a pre-professional training program for undergraduates. So one of the, the ways that this program came about was really to enhance this inquiry and communication of science to younger students. And um, past President Obama's science advisor, John Bolton, once said, if scientists would tie 10% of their time to the education of others, the world would be the better for it. So it's really based on this idea, you know, in the academy, outreach and scientific communication have not always been highly prioritized. And so it was a little bit out of the norm to go this route, but um, this is something I believe in really firmly. We try to have as many modes of communication as possible to excite others about science, as you've seen over the last couple of days in this wonderful conference. So again, like I said at the beginning, we want to communicate what science is, what scientific phenomena are, and then tell folks again and again and again, and ideally in as many modalities as possible, right? So it could be through a traditional um, transmittal lecture, kind of like I'm doing with you all right now, or through workshops, or through podcasts, any litany of communication modalities. But the theme is to hit as many of those modes as possible and then just kind of put it on repeat over and over. Something that we keep in mind that I would urge you to as well is that students really choose whether they like a STEM concept or not by fourth grade is what the After School Alliance has published on. And so if we want to engage folks in this larger STEM pipeline, we really need to be mindful of that age range. Because if we lose a student by fourth grade, it's really hard to get them back on track. Um, those of you who have middle schoolers at home can, can certainly vouch for that even more, but getting a middle schooler to change uh, ideas on pretty much anything is a real challenge. So that fourth grade is sort of our sweet spot. So we capitalize on the elementary school age and then hope to get them excited about STEM concepts at that time and then kind of just throw them through the pipeline in a supportive way to help them expand their own knowledge. You've probably seen some of these doomsday predictions related to a STEM workforce, and this is what's driving a lot of the work around these so-called STEM pipelines. Um, a lot of folks have mentioned that what students are being trained for today essentially won't be a job by the time they graduate. Another analogy is teaching an undergraduate to program the iPhone 5 when we're already on 11 and 12. And so just Pulling a few of these doomsday predictions from a variety of sources, we see that um, there are 15 jobs disappearing, 17% of 818 occupations will lose more workers than they add, 10 jobs that won't exist 20 years from now. So there's sort of been this shift from 
specific technical skills to now really focusing on the enhancement of what's normally called soft skills, but I would argue are the essential skills. And SciComm falls perfectly into this, right? It's a way to engage learners of all ages and all abilities. So I'm a Formula One fan. So yep, I got up early and watched the Formula One race this morning. But what's really important and is a STEM related concept is that the evolution of these cars, these race cars has varied dramatically just in the last 50 years, 70 years, excuse me. And so the major theme is that these cars have gained wings on the back of them. They are applying a lot more downforce, keeping the, the tires in greater contact with the ground and helping the cars to go so much faster. We are training engineers to be able to adapt and meet the needs of our current workforce and the future workforce. So again, the skill set's certainly necessary, but also the flexibility in learning and application are also necessary. When we look at the classroom, looking over the same range of, of years, they look a bit different, but not drastically different. There are still desks, most certainly. There's still an area where the teacher would spend most of his or her time. But now we see in our 21st century classrooms, things like technology being embedded into the classroom. Some computers, some collaborative workspace. The desks are now mobile. They can be rearranged instead of stagnant. But what's most important is to point out that our understanding of how people learn has really changed drastically during this time. So even though the, the setup of the rooms don't look that different, unlike the Formula One car where it was really apparent just by seeing the 1950 version and the 2020 version, there is a drastic change in what we've learned about learning, how students learn. So what do we know about learning? Well, in 20 minutes, what we can cover is essentially the, the big take home messages. So I would certainly urge you if discipline based education research is of interest to you to spend some more time looking about looking at the cognitive science literature. There's actually a great little map. It's a it's modeled off of a transit system surrounding student development theory practice. So um, that's linked here. You can certainly check that one out. And another resource, if you're tight for time, that I find is just absolutely essential is Make It Stick. And that book is kind of a, a novel-like book that summarizes a lot of the cognitive science literature from the last about 90 years. So it's a really great place to start. But one of the main themes that stand out to me continuously is this idea of scaffolding. So if students uh, can take what they know an idea, a phenomenon, again, going back to the first slide, maybe it's an influencer, maybe it's a certain content area that a student can connect with. If they can take that information and then build more knowledge on that pre-existing knowledge, that's really essential for learning. Similarly, having a relationship building and, and trust with their instructor or near peer mentors or learning assistants, whomever's trying to facilitate the learning, if there's not that trust and relationship building there, it can really go awry. I've seen this happen multiple times where instructors will try to use the best practices, things like inquiry-based learning or project-based learning or things where they, they know that it's the best for the learner eventually, but, but they don't take the time to say, hey, here's why I'm doing this. This is what the data show. This is how I can help you in your learning process. Without that information, then there's not that trust or relationship and there's not the learning that occurs. The third thing that really stands out continuously is leadership opportunities and learning. And we can facilitate this again really well using SciComm. Whenever students are given the opportunity to teach what they know, this is a leadership opportunity for them. It could be that a student comes late to class and relies on his or her peer mentor to share more of what they missed over that time. That's a leadership opportunity. Or let's say someone is repeating a certain lesson and the person who's already experienced it then serves as the leader again. 
A lot of us who are instructors already know that we learn best by teaching. So why not give that opportunity to our students? And the cognitive sciences literature supports exactly these things. So what else do we know about learning? I mentioned the pipeline. Most times these days we hear about pipelines related to workforce development, right? We've got to build that workforce. We need to get students in the STEM pipeline. But what does that mean? So these pipelines span different age ranges, but most of that pipeline, I would argue, comes from that theme of the transit map of the cognitive sciences. We need to be scaffolding learning for all of our students to support them as they advance through the grade levels. One of our interventions called Any STEM for You, we work with K through eight students in order to do this. Like I said, students kind of choose whether they like science or not by grade four. So we've got to reach out to them before grade four, excite them about science, see who wants to pursue science as a career, and then support them long after that. We also have these support programs, these pipeline programs at the undergraduate level. So undergraduates mostly know what they want to do, you would think, right? They've signed up for school, they've paid their fees, they've chosen a major. Well, a lot of them don't know what they want to do. Or they might think they want to do something, but they're not sure of all the options available with it. So partnering students with, again, teaching opportunities and research opportunities, which are shown as best practices for learning, really helps them to think about what they want to do long term, while synergistically developing the skill sets that they need for the workforce. Things like effective communication, critical thinking, and collaboration. So our model is really that we've been trying to interface with higher ed, so university professors, administrators, our K through 12 teachers and administrators, district-wide and statewide leaders, after-school leaders, and out-of-school ten leaders, legislators, funders, youth, parents, essentially hearing from every one of our stakeholders to essentially figure out what's needed for this quote unquote pipeline and help to meet the training needs for that. So we follow a constructivist framework. Now we're getting really nerdy on doing this and uh, we utilize mixed methods. And for our programs, we study certainly the impact on youth. So whether the youth are actually increasing their interest in science, whether they're improving in their science scores during the school day, and whether they're retaining the information that's shared with them. And then we also study our undergraduate mentors that serve as teachers to the students in an out of school time kind of setting. So we wanna see if community engagement and engagement through teaching helps them to stay retained in STEM, increase their GPA within a STEM discipline, and, and overall improve their marketability as they go on and pursue jobs. So I'm going to emphasize more on the undergraduate side since that's my main area of focus. But in talking about reaching youth, we use a, a couple of different assessments pretty routinely. One is the Harvard Paris Group Dimensions of Success instrument. And this was a uh, instrument developed thanks to funding from NSF to that pair group. And it essentially looks at quality of programming surrounding STEM. And then we also use um, a uh, youth program quality assessment by the Weikert Institute. And so we've published on, on both of these instruments. And so um, I'm going to skip over them a bit for sake of time. We have also implemented long term assessments. So we're really curious to see if doing hands on, minds on types of activities will help youth retain information longer. And that seems to be the case. So even testing students eight weeks post hoc. Um, they have an improved retention as compared with uh, the control group. So I'm really interested in challenging this framework of how we prepare undergrads for the workforce, right? We know the dire state, the jobs won't be available, how are students going to find employment, how will they be ready for the workforce? Well, critical thinking is usually the thing that pops up. Uh, most everyone would argue, well, students need to be able to think critically and the workers need to be able to think critically. But the data surrounding critical thinking is still very messy in the literature. There are several types of assessments, the CAT and the CCTST are two examples. 
And we've used the CCTST for our assessment. And essentially, this is a one hour long critical thinking assessment that students, uh, that students complete pre and post participation in our programs. And we find that students who participate as teachers and researchers within our any stem for you program have an improved post-test score, post-intervention, as compared with their age-matched, grade-matched, major-matched peers. And the ones that particularly stand out are analysis and numeracy. The last thing I want to emphasize related to the critical thinking and retention within the STEM workforce is that of the students that have participated in this program, we've had 96% that have completed a degree and actually 97% are in a STEM job at this time. So the pipeline theme seems to be working. So we're starting to challenge sort of the, the 1960s, 1970s theories surrounding student development and the cognitive learning. Um, we have one manuscript that's under review right now that I've just taken a screenshot from. And this is reinvestigating Chickering Spectres, which essentially talk through how a student develops through their learning process and what are the factors that most specifically impact their learning that lead to long-term success, i.e. workforce. And what we have found is uh, that there seems to be a weight ratio to what we need to engage our students in, putting heavy emphasis on things like serving as a lab assistant. And this is a, a likened to like a TA, a learning assistant. So someone who's taken the course and is now helping other students through the course, but spending specific cognitive time on learning how to be an effective instructor. And then similarly, mentorship comes through quite loudly, as we might expect. So more on that in the future. So taken together, um, I've shared just a short story with you today, most certainly surrounding some of the literature on the cognitive sciences, but uh, we always welcome collaborations. So if this area of research interests you, or if you'd like to bring some of our programming to a location near you, or um, participate in our Train the Trainer program to allow your own staff or students to do the same, or partner on grants, publications. We, we don't turn people away, so we'd love to work with you. And with that, um, I want to say a special thanks to all the folks that work on these projects, and I could fill probably five slides with the number of folks that work on these projects. I'm really grateful for all of our outstanding collaborators, so thank you. And lastly, thanks to our funders. With that, I'm going to um, escape out and see if I can see the chat a little bit more and address any questions you might have. Thanks. Thank you so much. Sounds like you're doing some amazing research um, that I would love to be part of at some point. I'm sure others would too. Um, if anyone has um, questions, just go ahead and please include them in the chat. We had a couple other people chime in about their STEM discipline or, you know, idol who kind of got them interested in STEM disciplines that you could read through too as well. Um, just to kind of get us started, I think uh, many of us are thinking about um, given circumstances with COVID kind of um, gaps in achievement that might occur based on students kind of access um, to learning opportunities now. Do you have any advice um, in terms of kind of bridging an achievement gap in STEM? I know that might not be exactly your area of research, but any thoughts on that? Yeah, certainly. So we've actually expanded to do a significant amount of rural programming at this time. And so I've now learned even more. I grew up in a town of 2000, so I thought I should have known this, but um, my town of 2000 had internet, but a lot of our other smaller towns uh, in rural Nebraska don't have internet, right? And so we can provide programming or videos or podcasts and all these activities for students, but if they can't access them, who cares, right? Um, so being cognizant of that is certainly most important. And as, as a consequence, we have started to create things that are accessible offline. So we're developing these STEM wear kits that can literally be mailed to individuals. And um, like others on the call, we've we're preparing a, essentially a textbook, textbook is the wrong word for it, an engaging you know, activity that can be mailed again. 
So yeah, it, it's a constant conversation and gratefully with our routine meetings with different stakeholders, we get lots of great ideas that help to, you know, give us more ideas on how to reach others. But yeah, it's a tough one, certainly. Awesome. Okay. Um, here's a question. Has your work at the K through eight level revealed structural barriers that children face before that critical fourth grade decision? If so, do you have ideas as to how um, non-educators can help intervene against these barriers? Great question from Natalie. Yeah, definitely. Great question. So Natalie, I have not seen that firsthand. Um, no, we haven't been, uh, we haven't experienced any barriers that exist. We've had students with a range of abilities within our programs. They've all been included. So I haven't seen any barriers personally. Great. Right. Um, and question from one of our wise SciComm program planners. Um, based on what you know about youth learning and engagement, what age groups do you think will be most impacted by the current pandemic in terms of losing effective educational experiences? I don't have data to back this one up. So this is pure opinion. Um, early childhood, I think, is the, probably the most stark. And then the second most is probably teenagers, simply because there's so much cognitive development, emotional development, social emotional learning that takes place during both of those ages, quite frankly. But again, I don't have data to indicate. So, yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. I always value your attention to the data that's available too. Um, it's interesting too because at the one of the first images you showed was of the classrooms in my son's classroom, he's in first grade, actually moved over to that sort of, sort of older, you know, layout of classroom with, you know, desks that don't move spaced out from one another. So I'm like, oh no, <laughs> what's this, this going to do? Um, okay, if anybody has any other questions, please go ahead and throw those in. I know we all, um, really appreciate this work you're doing. It's, it's just so critical um, for us to understand these things better. Um, and any closing words for people who might be doing um, communication kind of more broadly in terms of reaching youth audiences about to kind of get them excited in STEM, even if they're not maybe in a classroom or something like that? Yeah, I appreciate that. And I, I really appreciate you saying, you know, sort of the change in the classroom setting. And I think educators kind of get a bad rap about that routinely. Um, unfortunately, they get a bad rap about a, a bunch of things, even though our educators are on the front lines and working so hard to support right. our students. And gratefully, because we have learned so much more about how students learn instead of how we should teach students, um, which I would argue against 100%, uh, we do have ways to support our teachers even more so that they can have a voice and have great impact on our students. So no matter what the setup looks like and no matter what happens with COVID, our students are in really good hands. And I think the more that we can just use different modalities to share SciComm, you know, podcasts, videos, whatnot, um, the world will be the better for it, most certainly. So yeah. thanks so much for inviting me. I appreciate it.